to address it today. Uh, to talk about this topic, we have Professor Saman Amalasinghe with us today. Um, he is a professor at MIT. Uh, his research interests are in programming languages and compilers. And you'd be interested to know that he is the founding, uh, he's the founder of Lanka Internet Services, the first ISP in Sri Lanka. And he also went to the University of Muratua for a brief period of time before he started at uh, Cornell University. Uh, thank you for taking your time to join us uh, thank you. for this session. So uh, my first question to you is that how do you pick a research topic? I know that we have a broad idea as to um, what we are interested in pursuing for the PhD, but once you get into a uh, research area, how do you narrow down? How do you pick a good uh, so, research topic? Uh, I think for a lot of people who are still applying to computer, uh, to graduate program, I think it's interesting to look at that problem from the view of how to optimize the chances of getting into a graduate program. Uh, uh, so one thing, I will talk about the way MIT, how this process works. So different universities have different ways, but in MIT what we do is we do our admissions in broad areas. So for example, uh, all the uh, students who are applying for AI will be uh, evaluated by a group of faculty who are in AI. All the people in programming languages, in fact they do programming languages and architecture together, evaluated together. So sometimes what I find in these applications is you can't even tell whether somebody is into AI or systems. They, they will list the laundry list of things I'm interested in. I am interested in doing artificial intelligence and I'm interested in doing also uh, uh, web systems. And, and at that point, it's very clear to us that this person haven't figured out what he or she want to do. And that's not it. So the first thing is to pick up the area. Say, okay, I am in at least a broad area. So, okay, I, I, I go to research in operating systems or I go to research in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. If that is a little bit. Don't go too deep. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to say, I want to work in, in building a compiler for uh, uh, some very specific language, we'll say something like uh, uh, JavaScript. That's too broad because part of that is a lot of times when uh, somebody look at what's going on in research, uh, what get published, what's out there, are the research projects that started five, six years ago. Right. Research projects that started now don't even have research papers because they are just done yeah. and they haven't read any publication level. So if you go too deep, you are going to, you are saying that you want to do something of yesterday, not something of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the best way I would say is go take a look at what, uh, okay, one other thing is when you are applying, uh, you should have a little bit of a target audience on every university who might be the right faculty you want, you want to apply. Don't focus on one person. Because a lot of times, in some years, some faculty members say, we are not, I'm not taking these students. And we have years that say, okay, I'm not going on sabbatical, I'm not taking students, or my group is too big, I'm not taking students. So if you target one person, right. and that person is not hiring, mm -hmm. you're just out of luck. Mm -hmm. But if you say, I will work for anybody, that doesn't work either. So you have to find three or four people in that uh, possible area. And the best way is to go to their web pages and see what they have done. You don't want to say, I want to work in this exact project. I mean, I will tell you myself as example, when I was a student at Cornell, uh, uh, there was, uh, I, and I got into Stanford for going with my PhD, and there was, I really was into operating systems those days. I liked my operating systems class. And we were reading a bunch of papers uh, from uh, uh, now actually famous professor, professor David Sheraton on a system called a V-System. And I said, I am going to work on V system. This is exactly what I want to do. Right. Uh, this is a really cool project. And the minute I came to Stanford, I just went to uh, David's office and said, hey, I, I really want to work on V system. I realized at that point, V system is kind of done. Mm -hmm. I get all these papers because it's all system. And, and David is like, okay, I'm not doing anything more with V system. I'm doing this bunch of new things. Right. So I was kind of lost at that point uh, uh, in there. Uh, the difference is those days, you get to graduate school without really specifying exactly what you want to do. Today, unfortunately, the competition is much higher. So you have to be, if I had said in my application, I won't work with this system, in today's standard, I wouldn't have gotten it. Right. It was, uh, because it, it would have looked a little bit okay, too uh, old of a thing I'm going to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, 
So the key thing is, but on the hand, when you look at somebody's research, you get a feel for what type of stuff they are doing. Read some of those papers. And one thing you can mention in USA is that, okay, I'm interested in this area, but you can say, I really like these projects they have done. This, I, I, this appealed to me because of these reasons. If there's some good technical reasons you can explain, that can impress the faculty members. Yeah, he likes this project because uh, there are right reasons. So, so uh, what, uh, that is the right thing to do. Uh, other thing is, um, you what we are looking at is is that okay you have some idea what you want to do, not too specific but that some idea what you want to do and you have supporting evidence that say okay you will be good in this mm -hmm. so what that means is okay if you say all my previous projects are in uh, uh, operating systems but for my PhD I want to do uh, uh, do a medical system right. then there's a disconnect you can do that people have done that, but you have to prove to that person, okay, there's a real big reason I'm changing and there's something I'm doing. Right. So most of the time, even though when you're looking at it, it's basically trying to send yourself, saying, okay, look, here's something I, I really like to do, uh, and this is why I, you, I think I should be good at it. And what's happening lately is a lot of students here admitting already have publications. So it's getting almost harder and harder to get into a place like MIT without a publication. Now it's almost becoming necessary to get an internationally reputed publication. And at some point, uh, uh, publication should be at least somewhat related. Mm -hmm. So you feel that. Feel. And I mean, we discount the fact that a lot of universities might not have the breadth of uh, faculty at MIT, so they can't do research in exactly what they want mm -hmm. because they might not happen there. Yeah. So, so okay, they did research in, uh, 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 we will say, uh, uh, doing us, uh, something on operating systems, but they actually really want to be a programming language person. They are okay with that, something systems. But if you do research in something completely different and paper published there and then do something, it's, it's a little bit harder. That paper might not have that much of an impact yeah, in getting it. So, my feeling is, a lot of times when you're undergrad, uh, you're undergrad, lot of fields are very superficial. You see them in there, and and sometimes making a decision, just looking at the superficial uh, part, is probably uh, uh, not the best thing. So my feeling is, is just go to this website and see what what's happening, what's the state of the art. Mm -hmm. What people are doing, and and, and, and so when you're writing a, a, your uh, essay, it's good to say both why you are motivated to do that area, some mm -hmm. kind of high level thing, but also some kind of little bit of a technical level. Say these are the this is why I like this area. Mm -hmm. These are the type of things I want to do, and mostly I have done A, B, C, D, E, F, and I really like them, and 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 and, and therefore I want to continue doing something. Right. Would you recommend uh, contacting the professors before you? Uh so, uh, the, write the statement. unfortunate yeah. problem is these days I get probably mm -hmm. uh, like five letters a day from yeah, everybody yeah. who want to uh, uh, work with me. Our thing is, is unless, uh, uh, until somebody's admitted, I, 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 I don't have any band to talk to anybody. Right. So, so we talk a lot of schools after they get admitted, but uh, uh, contracting a faculty member before uh, uh, has very little uh, uh, impact. Especially if you probably want to respond, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but also a uh, uh, lot of times, at least in MIT, the uh, uh, admissions is done by not by all oh, the faculty who's uh, going to uh, get the student, but by two to two or three faculty group. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't contacted those faculty, it doesn't matter. So you could contact somebody else, but right. most of the time uh, uh, they don't go uh, uh, and get that information. Sometimes what happens is. There might be information exchange between faculty to faculty. Mm -hmm. If you, if uh, if you, if one of your advisors know somebody, it makes more sense to send advisor sends the mail to that other faculty member and say, look, I have this student who's really great. You guys should think about that. I mean, I get letters like that, and if I get it from people I know, I have I I get a bit of attention to those letters. Mm -hmm. right? Basically, even from well-known universities, I get letters. I mean, I I, I don't have time to type them. Right. I ignore them. Uh, so I guess we can move to the next slide. Uh, that's a very important topic uh, to uh, be successful uh, in grad school. How to pick uh, the perfect advisor for you? So it all also depends on schools. Like for example, a place like Stanford, mm -hmm. you get admitted to the department, and you come and you probably have a semester or two to find a quarter to there to find advisor. 
At MIT, when you get admitted, uh, before you even show up, there's a matching being done between advice and us. In some sense, you might not even have that much to say at, at mm -hmm. uh, uh, coming to MIT. Because uh, at some point, we have to, because the idea there is from day one, you want to get started in some ways. Right. However, there's a good possibility of basically changing advices or finding your match. So, so, so the key thing is, again, when you're applying, go look at the website, go look at what faculty are doing, and, and, and see whether you can have uh, at least an intellectual connection with the faculty. The other way I will look at a lot of times you to faculty members is also look at what their students are doing. Right. What they're doing after graduation. Because if you have aspirations to do something, there are different faculty, different groups have very different types of people they produce. Some groups, a lot of people go into industry, some people, some groups there are a lot of people go to a startup, some groups not go into academia. So so figure out the, the trail of students that faculty members has created. Look at their publications. And then there's an intangible basically is, is what kind of person that is. I mean, do you have a, I mean, connection to that person that you can work with that person? And sometimes it's hard to know. Like for example, when I uh, went to Stanford, I want to work with David Sheldon. I mean, that's, I mean, that was my ultimate goal. I went and talked. I had many meetings with him. And at some point, I realized our working method doesn't really care. I mean, he has a way of people with students that I didn't find that I picked very well. Right. And it was very frustrating. And then this new faculty member showed up, uh, 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 Monica Rapp, who became my advisor. I took a class from her. I didn't even think I want to be a compiler person. I took a compiler class because I had to take a class. It was an interesting class. Mm -hmm. and, and I really enjoyed it. Right. And, I, and I really enjoyed working with her. And, and, and then, like, slowly, I kind of said, OK, do you have any other any projects? And, and before I realized, I was successful. And so that was so, so there was a child. So, in some sense, I to stand for do one thing, I end up with something completely different. Mm -hmm. And part of that is also research, because if you can predict what outcome of a PhD is not a PhD. You're always doing something when you start beyond your scope, and sometimes uh, as you keep doing it, your interests change. Or sometimes it might be the same problem, but suddenly you realize the right method or approach is very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have, I have seen some students here who are doing things like uh, uh, um, this uh, Amy Williams, I think you probably not know her. She started as a student in programming languages group with Martin Reinhardt, and she was in, interested in some uh, uh, programming language issues about genetic coding. Mm -hmm. And once she started doing that, I realized it's not a programming languages issue. It's a lot more to do with uh, 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 basically uh, uh, Biological science and stuff, you just basically switch that advice. So, same problem, but different advice. So, those kind of happens as you start working. Yeah. You suddenly realize either your topic change, your interest change, or even what's necessary to solve that problem change. Right. So, so those, all those things are possible in some sense. Yeah. So, so, the key thing is the first gate is to get in. Right, right. Once you get in, there's a lot of uh, flexibility. Yeah. So, and also the hard time is things like uh, characteristic advice, how it's very hard to tell that. Right. Or uh, 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 like looking at yeah. somebody's email or looking at somebody's uh, 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 website that's not there. Yeah. So if you have friends you can talk with them, see that's great. But my feeling is first find uh, intellectual match, come. And then if you don't find the uh, real uh, connection to that person, then you can go and uh, 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 look at uh, how to change that. I guess that might be your next question. Yeah. Uh, in fact, can you change the next slide, please? Right, so the other question is, once you get into a research area, how easy is it to change the uh, advisor, the research topic, or even the school? <laughs> so, in some sense, anything is doable. Right. I mean, that's the way we go operating. Yeah, anything is doable. It's all how much potential are you willing to, because when you get comfortable in one thing, to go change is, is, is requires more effort. Yeah. So, uh, changing school obviously requires a lot more effort in there. Yeah. However, sometimes if people can move up, so come there, come to a school that might not be the top school, get some really couple of good publications, and 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 suddenly it's doing something really exciting. There might be a possibility of uh, uh, going to a different school. I mean, a lot of people like I know uh, come to MIT from other schools after doing a master's. They come to uh, another university, do a master's, do a really good master's, get a couple yeah. of publications, yeah. get to know a few faculty in conference and stuff like that, then mm -hmm. they apply for a PhD program. 
and yeah. they come. And I, I mean, I have a couple of students who actually did that. Right. That came to my group, and so that's a possibility most of the time. Uh, uh, that's a very nice place to switch because you have mm -hmm. completed something. You you are taking something like a master's. Middle of a PhD is harder yeah. because that means you have an, uh, uh, you have to transfer credit, transfer classes. It might not happen in a right. school. You restart something in there. Mm -hmm. Changing advices happens a lot. Yeah, within schools. Within mm -hmm. schools, sometimes it's because the student wants it. Right. Sometimes it's because the advisor. So sometimes the uh, advisor leaves the school. Mm -hmm. okay, you have no choice but to go find advice. The advisor doesn't get tenure. Right. I mean, you go find a different advisor. So there are a lot of things that happen. Uh, and sometimes it will always delay your graduation a little bit, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, unless, of course, you have really bad advice and then you try to switch because it will make things better, but that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. so, so switching is if it breaks mom momentum, so yeah. there's a little bit of that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's nothing called once you set, you have to just get in, in that mode. So the key thing is to first get into a place, figure out what you're doing. Uh, uh, my thing is, is unless there's some a really good opportunity or, or, or really bad situation, I would rather continue. I mean, the, the what's needed to change has to be pretty large. I mean, okay. it should be done in a way and I didn't like this person for, uh, for small reasons, so I'm switching. So it, right. it has to be something bigger than that. Research area has changed a lot. Yeah. Because you don't know what's the interesting area coming up. I mean, most people, when they start, like, for example, at MIT, you'll do a master's and then a PhD. Most people's PhD topic was probably not even thinkable when they start their master's. Yeah, sure. two, you know, two years is a very long time, and at that point, some new things keep happening. So, so the key thing is to be on the crowd, to look for interesting things, interesting topics, get the trends, and identify a PhD topic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes, I mean, if I look at time I was at, I mean, my topic kind of keep, kept changing a lot because uh, sometimes what people say is a PAB, you start by doing to do something really big. Mm -hmm. And you spend a lot of time doing to be big, but most of the time what ended up being is not what you started as a big. You basically, you do one tenth of what you thought you were going to do and you suddenly realize that that's hard, that's not that easy, and then by the end of it you have done something good and then it becomes a PAB. Right. And, and when I started uh, uh, actually Sometimes these things happen in this weird way. So when I started doing my PhD, uh, there was a there's a new breed of machines called uh, CBD machine. Uh, this, this company is called Maspa, and a bunch of them that came up with these really cool machines. And I thought, okay, look, I want to build a compiler. And I was just going doing it. It was a very hard project, and I was doing that. And then there was this another project. One of uh, my fellow students was doing, and he was not making that much progress. And I said, someone, can you just help them out? Mm -hmm. And I picked on it, uh, up on that project, and suddenly it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And before I realized, I, it became my day. And the best thing is, by the time I graduated, MassPy has already gone bankrupt. So if I had built a MassPy compiler, I would have been able to have a compiler for no machine. Right. So, so it was nice that actually I found this project, which was not more applicable when you, when you, when you finish. Uh, but, but I mean, that's the thing. I mean, key thing is you can't plan that fast. The key thing is to basically have forward momentum, but the PADs is something that that you have to find uh, uh, the, the ability to basically change course instantaneously. Like another example is is uh, uh, one of the projects I did at MIT was uh, build this system called Dynamo Review. Mm -hmm. It started as a dynamic optimizer, so we were trying to get uh, code running on uh, uh, basically binaries that you don't have source code to and optimize the binaries. So we're doing it in Excel, we build this pretty nice system, and we realize we cannot do too much optimizations because most of these codes had, had assumptions that basically nobody should be making. They were doing hacks, and if you do any small change, programs crash. Right. So, so it became very hard to do this, and it was very frustrating because small benchmarks, you could do these nice things, but if you try to do it in Microsoft Word or Adobe uh, 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 Illustrator, the program crash. So we were just kind of struggling with it. And then one day, this one student came to my office and said, Look, there's this interesting security thing. We can, by the way we are the basic instrument of the program, we can find worm attacks. So within about two hours, the entire research project changed. Yeah. 
So it only took us two hours. We said, oh my, that's a good idea. Okay, let's think through that and we, we brainstormed for two hours. It's okay, then we are doing that. And, and suddenly, some had like three people working in one direction. Completely changed even the field. Because we are not doing compile optimization anymore. We are, we are doing computer security. It's a very different field, different conferences, different everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, that became very successful. And, and in fact, I did, we did a startup with those students and, and prioritized that, that, that part. So that's the thing. The idea there is it's not, you have to be very nimble. Right. You have to find something, and sometimes you need to have the, the eye to know that's a good path happening. So right. if you just say, I'm going this way, I'm going to stay and do it five years, that's not a PLP. Yeah. PLP is like at every point you have these decisions to make, and it, uh, the ability to see that that's a better path to go. That's why PLPs are so different from a company. If you're working for a product, somebody write you a spec and say, here's the spec. Mm -hmm. You, well, so you follow the stick and, and, and the, the uh, research is you do something and at the end you write the spec. Right. Because at, at, but that means every point you can change anything. There's yeah. nobody is going to hold you and you didn't do what you asked for. Then the, that's the fun part of it because you can keep changing your problems. Yes. And, and, and a lot of good researchers are the ones who can identify the right place to change and right kind of uh, change for this. In some sense, sometimes Thing to say, okay, what's my thesis? Of? You have an area, you will work hard, you will do figure out what others are doing, keep pushing, but keep your eye open, and what will end up happening is not something you should be able to tell. Right. Uh, but at the same time, if you're applying, you should have a clear focus on this. Uh, yeah, and you have to have a, you need to be able to pick up to the area. The other interesting thing is also uh, you have to think about applying as a competitive process. Mm -hmm. You are competing and you apply for, with everybody, people from India, China, from Stanford and Berkeley, everybody is applying. Right. What is the advantage you have? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I can remember your application. <laughs> you were working with this system with uh, blood, 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 blood certificate. Certificate. Yeah. and then and also you are deploying it in, 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 in a hospital. hospital. Yes. That is something people are looking at here and say, wow, that's amazing, because here, to deploy anything in a hospital, it will take a hundred million dollars and, and, and five years of work and, and approval and stuff. You cannot deploy anything in a hospital. Right, right. And so when you find somebody that as under you deploying things in hospitals, that's a big thing. Because that's something nobody from Stanford is doing. Right. Because that's not going to happen yeah. in, 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 in their life, in, in that uh, short amount of time. Yeah. So the key thing is, are there things you can do that you can compete, because you can't compete directly in head on. With, with, with people in here because they have more resources, they have access to a lot of things and all those things. But the key thing is can you find a niche? Yes. And a lot of times if you can find a niche like that, yeah. that can make a much bigger impact in getting an uh, admission. Yeah. Something that is uh, uh, development country related or something that things like a medical thing they are, it's much easier to get done. Or, or something like that, if there's a project like that, those are the things. I mean, it's not cost work. What you're looking for is people who are, who, are, who are able to research, people who are who can do something unique. Research is all about doing something nobody has done before. Mm -hmm. and, and so because of that, looking for people who has that attitude. Right. And, and part of that is publication. Mm -hmm. That's important. Part of that is finding something to say, look, out of, because in MIT, I mean, we get, we admit about 10% of the people we see or even less. And when you get a stack of application, how do you stand out? Yes, yes. Um, and I also uh, attest to the idea of like uh, changing the research field because I'm not no longer doing computer vision uh, projects. Mm -hmm. I'm doing uh, web-related research, so it is possible to change uh, yeah. research mm -hmm. focus. So I think uh, to wrap up, uh, I'm going to ask you the final advice you would give to uh, people who are applying for grad school. So the application deadline is in yeah. December. So. Yeah. so Something that is now is probably too late. Try to get papers published, <laughs> and, and and I don't think you have time from now to December to get papers published. The other thing is, when especially when I came from Sri Lanka to US, I only knew the name of the universities. I didn't know any information. I mean, uh, only information you can get about the university is a small booklet they had in a. You have no idea what you're doing. Now everything is available to you. And what that means is, is you, when you apply, you have to become aware and, and, and become knowledgeable of that university, that department, what people are doing. Just, just stay on the web, 
go read papers, go look at the uh, uh, research they are doing. So people who seem to be on top of things and who understand what's going on has a much better chance of getting, uh, getting it. So take advantage of the resources. Don't just say, look, I like university because I have heard of it. No, I mean, say, okay, look, I really like this project he's doing and the impact has this has that was uh, very interesting. So have something a lot more direct to say. And of course, sometimes we find somebody sending an application to MIT saying, I really want to be at Stanford. They forgot to change the... Uh, Form letting that don't do that, and that's the last thing you want to do. So make sure that that you are personalizing it uh, 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 to each school, finding few faculty members that that you think work it. I I, th I think that's the thing. So you don't do too close, but don't make it very general. A lot of times, a lot of good students that the reason we sometimes don't take somebody that has amazing everything is we say we don't know what this person want to do mm -hmm. because at MIT especially we are taking somebody. That group already into a almost a faculty member who's going to be a supervisor. If we can't tell what this person wants, we cannot find that man. We, many times we have had uh, uh, issues of, of uh, not able to uh, admit really good students because we like when this person is doing amazing, but who's going to supervise this person? Right. And, and, and at that point, also the other part is uh, uh, each free area will basically we'll say admit. Five students. So if I am in programming languages, you know, if I had we uh, had to be five students. If there's a student who might do programming languages or AI, I don't want to admit in programming languages because I might if we do simple AI, I have only have only coming from the area. Right. At some point, I will keep asking, okay, why don't you guys admit that person? And they will say, no, no, why don't you guys admit that person? And and, and that's a very easy way to kind of uh, get dropped from the situation. Right. So so have that kind of a commitment to a broad area is necessary. So you can get fit and fall. Uh, and knowing what the faculty is doing is necessary, but not too much associating I won't work with these existing projects and, and, and that level. So the uh, key thing is, is, is uh, uh, one thing that you have to do is market yourself. Uh, uh, what's important is, is uh, 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 what you have, uh, uh, your statements are very important. Concise descriptions of what you have done in your projects is, is important. Also, when you look at each project, look at it from a research point of view. If you just say, I did X after that I did Y, like a project report, it's not that interesting for us. What we're looking for is not that you did a project, you carried out a programming task. What's research about it? What, what is the contribution to it? What's new? What's different? So even if you write a small paragraph, say, this project was very interesting and novel because of that, saying, I did this, I did this, I did And all probably impact. Okay, this project after doing it, had this impact would be interesting. Uh, uh, make sure your uh, uh, advisors also write good long letters because most of the time, if your letters say, this is the grade I achieved, you already know that. You already sent your transcript. You don't have to say what grades you got. You know, we know that information. But additional information, like how hard to get into uh, University of Moscow, that something is not in that I said, no, this person came fifth out of 100,000 paper taking exam. That's interesting. So, so, so put it in context, put the information that's otherwise not available. Is what, what you need to do. I mean, uh, uh, what you realize is, is we don't have that much time going over applications. We just a lot of times, the first read is probably somebody spent like five, six minutes just doing that. And within that, if you don't make an impression, that's the end of it. So you have to do that. You have to just make it concise, make it direct. And, and what we have to realize, what we are looking at is the really smartest place I can mind. The smartest people in the world who can do creative things. That's what we are looking for. And so if you have to convince uh, 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 that, that you are one of those people. And that's, that's how you get into good university. Okay, uh, with that, uh, we are going to finish uh, this session. Thank you so much, Professor Saman, for joining us. Thank you, and good luck. And hope uh, I get to see one of you, one or two of you, next semester. Okay, thank you.